Yo, what's up everybody, it's boy Jed here, and the Persona franchise has been going on for a very long time. Clash of Megami even broke a Persona in 1996 as a spin-off of Shin Megami Tensei, which is in and of itself a spin-off of the original Megami Tensei series featuring many games, novels, mangas, animes, and whatnot over the years. Not include spin-offs such as Persona 4 Arena, the Persona Dancing Games, Persona Q, etc. While these games did pretty well sales-wise, the game that really took the series to the next level from a well-performing series to mainstream worldwide popularity was 2016's Persona 5, which sold around 8.3 million copies. This game has gotten so much love from Alice over the years, being center stage for Persona Q2, getting an enhanced version in the form of Persona 5 Royal in 2019, and a Musou game, Persona 5 Strikers, in 2020. It also got its own anime, which, um... This is how your justice ends. Let's put an end to this! Pillage him! Say denial! Get in there! Is very great, but it recently got a new game in its lineup, Persona 5 Tactica, and that's what we're here to talk about today. Let's talk about it, shall we? Persona 5 Tactica is a tactical RPG that plays like Fire Emblem or XCOM, but with the Persona feel to it. Taking place after the defeat of Yad about before Joker leaves, the fan days are in LeBlanc hanging out before everything freezes and a strange symbol appears on the door. Upon opening it, they find themselves in a strange kingdom which is run by a strange pink woman named Marie, who mind controls Ryuji upon having her soldiers attack them, and eventually all of the Phantom Thieves with the exceptions of Joker and Morgana, and when the two continue to resist her, she chains them to her car and rides them around, even getting her own all out attack screen which is kinda cool. While the two struggle to continue to fight and are pushed to the back foot, they're rescued by Elle, one of the game's new characters, and she creates an opening for the two to escape as she leads them to an alleyway to speak to them before taking them to the Rebel Corps hideout. Which, in fact, turns out to be none other than LeBlanc. <laughs> Joker and Morgana speak with Elle and learn that one day, Marie just showed up and seized control, and under her control, things have been hell for the residents of the kingdom. They make a deal with Elle and join the Rebel Corps, and in return, she and the Rebel Corps will help them get their friends back. Afterward, they get word from Lavenza to visit her in the Velvet Room, which, upon entering and seeing what the Velvet Room looks like, they learn that it suddenly looks very fucking different, and learn from Lavenza that some strange other power is affecting even the Velvet Room and changes its appearance, and when they ask about her outfit, they learn that she chose to dress like a fucking blacksmith, and she chose that fit simply to fit the aesthetic of the new Velvet Room, which I personally just love because it just confirms that, like Akira, Lavenz is a massive fucking dork, and it's adorable. I love it. It's amazing. After leaving, they get a shit ton of guns and a letter from an unmarked senator, who is very clearly Lavenza, telling them that they'll need weapons for their journey, and in return for payment, they'll make the weapons. Eventually, the trio receive word from one of the rebels about one of the prisons in Marie's castle, and upon raiding Marie's castle, where they expect to find the rest of the Fainting Thieves, they instead find and free a captured Toshio Kaskabe, who is suffering from amnesia and also seems scared of two girls specifically who were guarding his prison, especially one who he describes as having a whip and a brazen leather outfit. The two girls in question turn out to be An and Futaba, and upon fighting them, they learn that the only way to set them free from Marie's mind control is to remove the flag, but even if they do, it will eventually come back, and it's here where Elle awakens to her ability, the Flag of Rebellion, and, with Joker's help, takes down Marie's flag and replaces it with her own, freeing An and Futaba from the mind control. The two recover, the team regroups at the hideout and questions Toshiro a bit, and then they speak to An and Futaba after they've recovered. This is basically the cycle for the entire kingdom. Find them as the Phantom Thieves, mind controlled, set them free, speak to them after they've recovered, repeat until all the Phantom Thieves are free. The only time this differentiates is the third time you have to do the cycle, where you have to do it from Rakuto and Yusuke during Marie's wedding ceremony, where it's revealed that the person she was meant to be wed to was not Yusuke like the group theorized, but is in fact Koshiro, as during the sequence, this happens. <laughs>
Yeah, L gets shot, and this time around, Tushro is the one who needs to plant the flag, and he does just that. That's a dub as one for Tushro, because he's very scared to do so, but he does it anyway. Afterwards, Tushro theorizes that this world Marie and is soon proven right that when they reach Marie's castle and find a bunch of interactions between Tushro and a woman named Marie Anto, the real world version of Marie, to whom Tushro is engaged. Funny enough, after learning this, there's a bit where Akira thinks about marriage and who, who in the fan he to marry, and you get different interactions with the different members, which is pretty funny. You even get wedding interactions with the male characters, and all of them are very funny, very cute, it's nice. Eventually, the thieves do confront her when mid-fight, Toshiro runs off, and come the end of the fight, it turns out Toshiro actually climbed onto the roof and pushes the wedding belt onto Marie, crushing and defeating her. However, before she dies, she brings to mention Toshiro's crime. When they go to leave, hoping they'll be going home, they instead end up in an Edo-era style kingdom ruled by Lord Yoshiki, a Buddha-like figure who rules his kingdom under a pretense of love, but is in fact a tyrannical ruler fueled with anger. The group is helped by a woman named Yuki and actually gets some sick new costumes here, and that there's a neat little fan service scene with they, what they do which is nice. They actually does this a lot and it's really nice every time. Eventually, through fighting Yoshiki's forces, the Aizen Squad, they learn that Yoshiki is actually Toshiro's father, Yoshiki Kasukabe, a corrupt politician who raised Toshiro so hardly and strictly to the point of abuse. One cool detail though, shortly before the scene where they learn this, there's a neat part where the fan thieves break into the Aizen Squad's garrison and it's there where you can choose whether you want to go with Makoto's group or Yusuke's group, and you get different interactions depending on which group you decide to go with. If you choose Yusuke's group, you get to see Arlen's terrible acting play out and see how Yusuke makes it work in their favor by pretending that Arlen is drunk and in order to get the required information they need. Meanwhile, if you choose Makoto's group, then you will instead get to see Makoto constantly having to hold yourself back from beating the hell out of one of the talking, the drunken squad soldiers who keeps chatting shit before Akira comes up with the idea to have a drinking contest, making use of a little detail that some of the sake jars are instead filled with water. Of course, Makoto drink wins the drinking contest because it's fucking water she's drinking and asks where to find the control room with the cameras, causing the drunken soldier to realize that the group from the labor camp they attacked prior to this one was actually them, and so when he denies their request, Makoto pressures him into speaking before knocking him out. But regardless of which troop you choose to go with, Futaba gets the information and with help of Toshio, clears the cameras and the group attacks the Aizen squad. After attacking them and leaving, combining the information that Yoshi gives Toshio's father as well as his connection with Marie with the fact that the password to the control room was tied to something Toshio knew in his head, the group make the realization that this world seems to be made from Toshio's cognition. In the final confrontation with Yoshiki, the thieves learned that Yuki is actually Toshiro's deceased mother, and when things seem to be going poorly for the fan of thieves, Yuki shows up with the settings of the kingdom and attacks Yoshiki, allowing the fan of thieves to defeat him before taking a shot for Toshiro and dying in his arms, and making Toshiro promise her that he wouldn't have any regrets about what he did in the past. Upon the defeat of Yoshiki, the group happens to see the way the city was destroyed in the fight, but also the citizens resolve to rebuild it. The group then leaves to the next kingdom, which is actually a school that, funny enough, looks very similar to St. Hermelon, the high school the cast of Persona 1 goes to, which is a really cool detail. Maybe it actually is St. Hermelon, as it's never said what the school is or its name, or maybe it's just supposed to be a reference to the design of St. Hermelon. Regardless of which it turns out to be, this school instead turns out to be Toshiro's former high school. And as the group searches for the four keys to find the ruler of the kingdom, they learn about Toshiro's past with a girl at his school named Ari Natsuhara who was a former student council member and Toshiro's implied crush and throughout their time in this kingdom, they learn more about how the two got to rally a student rebellion against the vice principal Ichiro Nakabachi after receiving a bunch of reports of different types of abuse and blackmail and succeeding in doing so. However, the student rebellion gets so out of hand, it ends up turning into a lynch mob of students going after him, some of whom weren't wronged by him in any way, shape, or form, which results in him not only going insane, but doing this. Yeah, the psycho pushes her onto the train tracks, being very badly injured and hospitalized as a result. 
as well as losing her will to fight. The more they learn about Toshiro's time with Eri, the group point out the various similarities that Elle shares with her from them looking similar to them both having very headstrong attitudes. Assuming the ruler of the kingdom to be Nakabachi, they confront him and after doing so they learn that Nakabachi isn't the ruler of the kingdom and that the ruler of the kingdom is in fact someone else, who in turn not only kidnaps Elle, but kind of changes the way the kingdom looks. And also, Toshiro has a mental breakdown upon him how badly Eri was hurt and the harassment he suffered after her injuries, which resulted in surprising that Futaba of all people smacking him back to reality and giving him a wake up lecture when he asked to be left there to die. Which is really nice because you wouldn't expect of all the characters Futaba to be the one to jump up and smack the fuck out of him and then lecture him. Futaba. This is Futaba Sakura that we're talking about. The character who really only speaks to the Phantom Thieves and their associates. She, her interactions with Toshio throughout this entire game are really, really nice. Like it, it really shows how much she's grown, and I love that. It's great. But after the regrouping at the hideout, the group decided to go after Elit. In their attempt to save her, the group learned that the kingdom's true ruler is in fact Toshiro's shadow, being shrouded in hatred and, hatred and resentment for Eri as he blames her for the torment, trauma, and dismay that Toshiro suffered, and now aims to be completely rid of El, who is a cognitive being based on Eri, as El, killing El, will get rid of Eri entirely from Toshiro's mind and heart. When Toshio begins to fall in despair, El calls out to the despairing Toshio, who remembers that Eri told him that the victims of Nakabachi thanked them for helping him, specifically naming the first victim who came to them for help, a girl named Yuri Kurama, and that Eri doesn't regret their actions despite how things ended up. And upon remembering this, Toshio not only takes Joker's blade and attacks Toshio, Shadow Toshio with it, which causes him to drop Eri, but unlike his failure to catch Eri in the real world, this time he succeeds in catching her, and after he catches her, you get one of the dopest cutscenes in the entire game. うるせえ。お前の言葉はもう僕には届かない。そうだ。私は覚悟を決まったみたい。<笑> あらゆる苦痛はあなたの心を惑わせる。けれど、紡がれた日はいかなる逆風でも消えはしない。もう一度ここから始めよう。我は何時、何時。もしかしてあれ違いにペルソナだ撃ち抜けエルネスト僕はナス革命を僕自身の革命を Yep, not only does Toshiro have an awakening, but L turns into Toshiro's persona and the group defeat Shadow Toshiro. But this ad catches the attention of the true mastermind behind all of this, the godly being Samael, who made this whole world having aimed to repress Toshiro's inner will to rebel in an attempt to forcibly bring about peace. 
However, when Samuel disappears, the group all agree to go fight it, however question how they're going to get to it. But then Lavenza arrives to take the group after Samael by bringing the Velvet Room to them, and it's now changed into a fucking train. And on the way there, Lavenza explains to the group that the reason Elle is able to become Toshiro's persona while also being her own self and turning back is because she's a cosmic being created by Toshiro's heart and will to rebel, as a result of Samael attempting to crush Toshiro's will, and as such, Helis's will of rebellion and power to fight, making her serve as both her own separate cognitive being, but also Toshiro's persona. A neat little gameplay detail that I find cool is that if L is on your team when you use Toshiro's persona, you'll actually see L disappear, which is a neat way of mixing gameplay and narrative. Speaking of gameplay, let's actually talk about that for a second, because each of the kingdoms build upon the mechanics you already have and have seen, and the final area is really just a reflection of this. I kind of talked about this a bit at the start of this video, but gameplay-wise, this game is just your typical tactical RPG, a la Fire Emblem, Disgaea, XCOM, etc. It's very basic at the core level, but it incorporates a lot of elements from the Persona franchise, like the Q games especially, such as every character with the exception of L <coughs> getting a sub-Persona, which gives them more skills and abilities, but also building these characters with their different skill trees is pretty cool because they have so many different skills so there's so many different ways you can go about it and you can even change and remove skills plus this game is very generous with giving you gp for your characters so you can get a lot of skills even before endgame allowing l a way to keep up even without the ability to use a sub persona the only character I even remotely had a problem with in any fashion was Futaba, Futaba because Jesus fucking Christ her skills are expensive. Granted she doesn't have nearly as many as the other characters but god damn. Especially her third one which is 120. Who thought this was okay to make her stuff this costly? Fucking hell. <laughs> Also, the game's version of an all-out attack are called triple threats, where if you knock an enemy down and form a triangle formation around them, any enemy caught in it, it takes damage, and it can even be get so strong that it can one-shot enemies. It's a really cool way of adapting the game into a new format fitting for a tactical RPG. You also get a new mechanic in the second game called follow-up, where you can knock an enemy down from a higher platform, and if you have a unit right below them, they'll shoot them the enemy downing them and giving the person who knocked them down a one more so they can move again and it also doesn't take anything away from the character who did the follow-up action and it also does more damage so it's a it's a it's a worthwhile investment use it make use of it as best you can because it, it does come in handy in the third kingdom there are speakers that restrict different actions in the field of range and the more speakers there are the more the actors restricted and if you take that action within that range you will take damage Thankfully, you can destroy the speakers, and if you do, you have less restricted range, but they require a lot of damage to destroy. So it may not seem worth it to take all that time and to just complete your objective instead, but the game also has side quests that give you around 20 GP, as they'll often lock you into two characters and you need to pick a third whoever it may be, and they contain some pretty entertaining side stories like Makoto and Ryuji being interested in this random wooden crate in Yoshi's kingdom. Because something about it seemed weird to them, only to find it just a bunch of Yoshiki merch that none of them want. Or this one in Akabaji's kingdom where Elle wants to learn to fight more like how Akira does, keeping himself calm and collected, and learns how she can make use of her environment as opposed to charging straight in every time. And they also each have different challenges to complete. There's one where you need to make use of the one more mechanic to get someone to the goal. There's one where you need to take out all the enemies in one turn, make use of both the one more knockback and the triple threat mechanics. Also, starting from Kingdom 2 onwards, Lavenza can craft weapons for you as well, which is nice because it is cool and very useful as they can be very powerful and helpful. And even have different effects, like there's a gun that can hit you as the, uh, the hypnosis effect, and it'll, um, it'll, like, cause your enemies to move, as that's what hypnosis does in the game. Also, a good little Valorum detail is that when you, Lavenza fails a fusion, you get a cute little animation where everything explodes and goes boom. <laughs> but also, when you go back to the menu, Lavenza will have her messed up hair. It's adorable. <laughs> there's also voltage attacks in this game, which is a new skill specifically to this game. And the way it works is there's a star saved gauge right above the character's icons that fills up whenever either you take damage or deal damage to an enemy. Once it fills up, you can use the voltage skill and everyone has their own unique voltage attack their own unique effects and animations it's really cool and they're all really unique and they all fit the specific character as well it's great the voltage attacks love them love them to death but that's all there really is to say about gameplay right now though so let's go back to the story 
The group pursues Samael and along the way they run into the various foes that they faced along the way, having to redo the boss fights against Mirage of Marie, Yoshiki, and Shadow Toshiro. Only now they're much stronger than the initial boss fight, though this time Toshiro stands up to them and refuses to act down from them. Thankfully though, if you remember the boss fights, then you'll be fine because they work exactly the same, gimmicks and all. Eventually, the group reached Samael and challenged it with this boss fight's gimmick being the stage itself, as the entire boss fight basically plays out on a clock. Samael has a skill called Forward or Reverse, and there will also be a number attached to it, and that's how many forward or backwards the gears will go, and depending on the number, the attack states. Thankfully, it's only ever those five gears, but if you're on the last gear that is going forward or backwards, you'll be teleported to the other side, though you will take damage. So choose wisely about the way you want to move your characters, and whether or not it's worth it to tank the damage to get closer to Samael. After beating his first phase though, he eventually transforms and reveals his true form and goal to completely eradicate the will of conflict from all humanity. This starts the second phase of the boss fight, which takes place directly after the first. Thankfully, the only thing, things you need to worry about are the Spire of Judgment that will occasionally appear at the end of the second phase, which you need to destroy as it can wipe out your entire team. Thankfully, a single all-out attack will be destroyed and the skill Holy Numbers of Salvation, which will light up any of one of the five panels with the number from 1 to 4. And that number is how many people you need to get to that specific panel, or else Samael will use Divine Judgment and do big damage to your team. So make sure you're attentive to that, because if you have too few or too many, you will get blasted with big damage and stunned for an entire turn, by the way. If you do make it past this, though, you get one of the game's final cutscenes, and to me, one of the sickest ones. <laughs>君には随分迷惑をかけた。すまない。だが、こんな僕にも意地がある。戦うことを教えてくれた怪盗団をみんなの意志を守りたい。苦しむ誰かを支え、共に戦える人間でありたい。だから力を貸してくれ。もう一度
勝ち取る明日を選ぶ。After that badass cutscene, the group celebrate their victory before fleeing to the train where they see the various people from the kingdoms they helped before stopping at Marie's kingdom where they say their goodbyes to not only this world but also to Elle as she'll be returning to Toshiro's heart. Upon returning to the real world, the group question where Toshiro is and come to the realization that since Toshiro came to the world in a different way than them, it had stayed to reason he'd return elsewhere and decide to wait. Meanwhile, Toshiro reappears in the real world before his father and Marie who tell him they'll be hosting a press conference that he'll be reading the script that Toshiro's father prepared, stating that he was secretly hospitalized, and while to their faces he agrees, once they leave the room he proceeds to rip up the script before leaving to the press conference. Sometime later the group are together again and see a news broadcast stating that the political world is still in turmoil and that investigations into Yoshiki and Marie are still going on, for the group starts talking about Toshiro's actions on the press conference, where he revealed he would be resigning from the diet and that indicted that he indicted his father for his crimes, causing turmoil in the political world, but the group theorized everything will turn out okay, even if the dust won't settle anytime soon. So they do wish they could contact Tosho, but can reconsider due to the fact that public security is keeping an eye on them. However, at the very moment, the group get a phone call with a familiar voice on the other end, which is none other than Toshiro. Joker and Morgana speak to him and find out that he's doing well and that he's considering starting over as a pol politician in hopes of becoming a politician everyone can stand behind and he vows to one day turn the world into one that no longer needs the Phantom Thieves. Not long after he hangs up, but not before promising to one day visit the cafe again. After this phone call, Akira and Mo Mona relayed this info to the others and they're glad to hear he's doing well, but seeing how real his resolve was reinforces them all to chase after their own goals in life and the challenges that face them and with that, credits roll. And during the credit sequence, you actually get to see all the different artwork cinematics, kingdoms, and areas you fight in. It's really cool. But after that, you get this beautiful post-credit cutscene.
まってた Yep. Toshiro gets reunited with Aerie and she's now walking on crutches. And it's a very nice moment. This whole game is really nice. Honestly, my only real issue with it was the price, as I genuinely don't believe it's worth 60 to 80 bucks. But I do believe it's worth playing if you like Persona, specifically 5, and are into tactical RPGs. So if that sounds interesting to you, do get it whenever it goes on sale. But if my only real issue with the game is the price, that's saying a lot towards the quality of this game. As all my other issues are minor things that just kind of get on my nerves personally, that in the grand scheme of things really don't matter. Like Futaba's skills requiring a massive amount of GP just to get one. However, I can understand because she has a significantly less amount of skills as opposed to everyone else, or the First Kingdom being pretty mediocre for everything that takes place after you free Makoto and Yusuke. But thankfully, there isn't much after that anyway, so it doesn't drag out at all. Plus, the rest of the kingdoms are all really good for Tosho and his character, especially the third one. This is a damn good game. It has fun gameplay with lots of interesting and unique features, a really nice art style, dope music, and tons of content for you to experience with just the based game alone. But there is more to this game, as it was also announced the game would have a DLC store of Repaint Your Heart, and frankly, I've got mixed feelings on it. On one hand, the additions of Kasumi and Akechi are fun. I like both of these characters, they are right. One of the new characters, Guernica, has an amazing design. The whole aesthetic of Repaint Your Heart, like the, the it's really cool. The, the street, the paintball aesthetic, I love it. It's great. It's, it's really, really cool. The storyline is pretty short, so you can run through it kind of fast, and beating it unlocks Kasumi and Akechi for you to play even in the base game. And the paint mechanic is a really unique and fun gameplay gimmick. Also, the storyline is kind of engaging for something that is as short as it is. Trust me, this is going to get important later. But on the other hand, not only is it a complete scam price-wise, as it's 20 bucks, which I only call a scam because not only are the other DLCs super cheap, you also have to pay 60 bucks for the base game already, but the boss fights gets incredibly repetitive after a while, as you fight Derrick every other boss fight, and the same boss three times over. But to make things worse, the only thing the DLC is worth getting for, aside from Kasumi and Akechi, the story is fucking garbage by the end and is completely pointless. Which I know sounds like I'm contradicting myself when I said the story is somewhat engaging, but in order for you to understand what I mean, I'm going to have to explain the DLC story, which I'm going to run through quick, because this video is probably getting way too long as it is. The story of Repay Your Heart follows Akira, Akechi, and Kasumi as they traverse through an urban style alternate dimension known as the streets, finding a mural depicting Arsen and getting sucked in. The cutscene when they do get sucked in into the mural has a really cool first person perspective from Akira's POV, it's really cool. After getting sucked in, however, Akira finds himself separated from Akechi and Kasumi, but after being surrounded by enemies, eventually the trio hear a scream and run into a masked woman and a parrot, gleefully committing a massacre on these mouse elf fighted mascot beings called Mouse Scots who upon being shot, explode into paint. Upon being confronted by the group, the girl named Guernica attacks them, and soon the group is cornered, but they're rescued by a mysterious blue-haired girl in a mouse cut costume named Luca, who takes them to a mural of our son being destroyed by a rat, and upon seeing it, Kasumi gets a weird feeling which is revealed to be Guernica's true power, to force one's dark feelings in the deepest pit of their soul and force them to take over their mind, and ask the group to help take back Guernica's first art piece, but was initially declined by Akechi, who asked her if she was the one who brought them here. But she reveals that Ganika herself brought them here to the streets as a final act of desperation before completely losing her sanity. After learning this, they agreed to help and set out to find the different pieces of Ganika's first art piece as it was broken into three pieces. Along the way, they're constantly stalked by Jerry, a pink bird who seems to be manipulating Ganika, and at one point sends her to go and fight the Phantom Thief. And when she runs into them, Luca tries to talk her down but fails to do so, and the group decide to retreat before going to get the second piece of the slab. Though after taking out the shadow guarding it, Guernica finds them again, though after seeing the second part of the slab, her head begins to hurt, resulting in Luca running up to her to ask if she remembers her and claims to be Guernica's sister. Though Guernica smacks her away, calling her a liar, and retreats however upon returning home, Jerry manipulates her in her weakened state, altering her rage. The group takes the slab and leaves, and Luca reveals to the others that she is indeed 
Danica's big sister. However, the real Luca died years ago, and that she's more of a memory, and that the reason Danica has been acting like this is because the piece was broken. The group find their way to the last lab, however, upon searching for it, they find a massive pile of corpses, and Danica approaches them once again, and after conversing with her, they get into a fight. And after defeating her, Guernica begins to remember her past, so Jerry summons shadows to hold off the others while she retreats with Guernica, and after the fight, the group go to find the third slab piece after and retreat after to restore the mural. After doing so, they fired Guernica one final time, and Luca manages to bring her back to normal at the cost of her own life. Guernica betrays Jerry, and with the help of the Phantom Thieves, defeats her, resulting in the others being sent back to the real world and losing their memories for going their own separate ways. However, Danica still remembers her encounter with them and credits That simple of a story, right? Short, simple, easy to understand, right? I will say this though, credit sequence has this neat little paint effect to it, which is kind of cool. Same thing as the last one where you see the characters walking by, you see all the areas that you fought in, but there's like a little paint effect that I think really like, is, it's pretty cool. It's nice. I like it. I dig it. I love it. But the thing that makes this whole DLC effectively pointless is the simple fact that the others lose their memories. And not only that, they never find out who Jerry really is, which was a big part of the mystery, especially for Akechi. Who is Jerry? You never get an answer. You get a hint as to who superior, who her superior is, and since you've likely played the main story before it, it's obviously Samael. But also, with the others forgetting everything that happened, it results in the entire thing feeling kind of pointless. So you don't really care about Guernica, and the character you spend the entire DLC with, Luca, dies. So forgive me for not really caring that Guernica got herself back. It just does nothing for me, especially since she spent the entire time trying to KILL US! It just doesn't feel worth it in the end. But that's really all there is to talk about in regards to Repaint Your Heart and Persona 5 Tactica as a whole. And frankly, outside of the issues I had with the DLC story, everything else was really good. It was really, really nice aesthetic. Pretty, some challenge, surprisingly challenging boss fights, and so on and so it's, it's much the same as the base game, really. The paint mechanic is really nice, I've gone over that already, and everything else, but I cannot once again recommend this game enough, especially if you like Persona 5. And with things like Persona 3 Reload and Persona 5 X coming, I can't wait to see what the future has in store, not just for Persona 5, but for the Persona franchise as a whole. Hey, thanks for watching. I'm so glad to finally be done with this video. You have no idea. I'm glad I was able to get my thoughts on this game out there, finally, for the world to see. At this time, this video released for something real that is probably already out, and I'm probably playing it as we speak, which kind of blows, but no biggie. I was kind of hoping to get it out before Reload came out, but I'm just glad it's out. <laughs> now, I'm going to be gone for the month of February to handle some personal things, but you can still find me on things like Friends channels or shows and whatnot that friends do because i sometimes make guest appearances on their channels so go go sub to, go sub to my boys bro because if you, if you want to see me i'll be there but in my free time i will keep working on the video so that when i come back you got i have more content to pump for you guys and whatnot and so on and so on anyways <laughs> i'm gonna stop wasting your time now if you did enjoy this video be sure to leave a like comment and subscribe and if you didn't you can tell me how much i suck as both a youtuber and a vtuber in the comment section down below Peace out and enjoy yourself. Your words messing with my head. All the things I should've known. Had enough and packed your bags, but left the bullshit at the door. Was it something that I said? Cause I never really talked, but I'm done wasting my time on something I don't even want. Oh, oh.